Well, good morning. So I've got some time with you here today to talk about diabetes. And so, um, first of all, thank you for being here, and thank you for the work you do on behalf of Eastern Kentucky and in support of the people who live out here in the Eastern Kentucky region. One of the things that's really special, and I've had the opportunity to travel the state and see all the 61 health departments and be in all the different regions, and I still got a ways to go in the counties. I've been to 80 or so of the counties, so I got 40 more to go. So if I have more time after next week, then I'll get the other 40, hopefully, in the years ahead. So uh, each of these regions has their different feel, has different sense of community, sort of a different flavor uh, about them. One of the things that is really striking about Eastern Kentucky is just how strong the sense of community is. And, and I, I'm not saying there's not strong community other places, but it's really distinctively strong here. And as I look around the room and the folks that I know, and I've been out here multiple times, and f both for good things and unfortunately for bad things, for the floods that went through, um, is how people rally together and come together. And obviously, we're not going to solve these problems unless we find solutions that work for and are accepted by the community. And so your role in this is essential to any success we're gonna have. And so thank you for what you do, because if we're gonna find a way to turn this around and have better health, it's gonna have to be because the people who are supporting the health of the community have identified and found things that the community itself will accept and embrace and take ownership in for themselves as well. And, and that won't happen with folks like me just traveling in here and parachuting in just to say things. It's going to happen with people who live in the communities, who understand the communities, who know the people, and can do it in a very, very personal way. So thank you very much for what you do, and please know that I'm grateful for that. I don't normally rattle off lots of data, and I seldom use slides. <clears throat> I think most people uh, relate much better to, relate more personally to stories and real impact on people. Uh, I also know that uh, people will forget virtually everything that I say to you here today. Very little of what I say will you remember, no matter how I try to drill it in. What you'll remember when I leave here are things more like, yeah, he seemed like a nice guy. I wouldn't mind if I had to hear from him again. If I could have a beer with him, you know, or go out for some barbecue, that will be okay. That's what you're going to remember. That's the whole Maya Angelou quote. For any of you who have heard that before, people will forget what you say and do, but they'll never forget how, they, how you make them feel. So I keep that in mind when I give these presentations, that more often than not, it's an opportunity to leave just a handful of points and try to motivate people and about the ability they have to make the world a better place themselves. I'm going to depart from that and I'm going to rattle off a bunch of statistics here. Because when I look at the agenda, you've got a whole a number of people who are going to come afterwards and talk about actual work being done by partners in the community and talk about specific programs, specific resources, specific tools. So I'm going to set a stage here at the start just with some data. I'll start nationally, come down to the state, and then go down specifically to eastern Kentucky. So first of all, nationally, more than 30 million people in the United States are diabetic. It's probably around 10% of the total population are diabetic. Nationally, about 96 million Americans, a third of the population, are pre-diabetic or diabetic. Of those pre-diabetic people, those 96 million people, 90% of them probably don't even know it, just to put that in context. So it's hiding out there in plain sight. It's in all of us, or most of us, a third of us at least, and yet nine out of 10 of us are unaware of it. That's huge. That's an enormous problem. And when you come down to Kentucky, unfortunately we distinguish ourselves not in a positive way here. So Kentucky has just under a half million diabetics. It's just under 14% of our population who are diabetics. That's more than one in seven. All right, so if we were to do a little exercise here, and I'm not seeing, the biggest table has six people at it here, but, but at a table of six, if we had one more, one of those people at one of these rounds would, would have diabetes. Our 13.8% of the population compares to 10.9% nationally. That means we're 26% higher than the national average, and you know we're helping to pull that average up. So it's probably even worse compared to the states that are doing well. In Kentucky, 
and this is alarming, from 2000 to 2021, so about two decades, the rate of diabetes has doubled in just two decades. I don't know how you define a generation, but for whatever reason, I kind of think about 17 years in my head as kind of a rough generation. That means in just over one generation, or in about one generation, we have had the rate of diabetes double. That's an alarming growth. It was 6.5% back in 2000, and now it's 13.8%. That's not heading the right way, of course. Kentucky ranks fifth highest in the United States for diabetes prevalence, fifth highest. Again, we're at the top of the wrong list uh, for this. Unfortunately, even within that unpleasant statistic, there are disparities. And so the African-American community in our state has an even higher rate of 18.5% compared to the Caucasian rate of 13.5%. So even within the disaster, there's a, bigger, there's a small, bigger disaster. The age uh, that you, your age changes or in, impacts this. The older we get, the more uh, likely you are to be diabetic. And there's a slight higher uh, prevalence in men than women. In Appalachia, the prevalence of diabetes is 17.2% compared to 11.9% in non-Appalachia. That is really problematic. Diabetics have worse problems with diseases that are cardiovascular diseases, so stroke, eye problems, heart attacks, kidney disease, and a number of other problems, non-healing ulcers, uh, skin problems. Um, all of these things, remarkably, could be largely averted with what seem relatively simple interventions, but if they were easy, they're simple, but they're not easy, because if they were easy, we'd be doing them already. So we'll touch on that in just a minute. The five area development districts, you're all familiar with that concept, I think, in Kentucky, so there's about 15 of them, I think, uh, area development districts. The five of those, so these are clumps of counties that kind of think and work together sort of for develop economic activity, development, other various other activities. The five area development districts with the highest rates of mortality are in Eastern Kentucky. And Kentucky hospital discharge data shows that in 2021, diabetes was the primary diagnosis for 14,212 hospitalizations. The average length of stay for a diabetic hospitalization is about 6.6 .6 days costs about $46,000, and the total charge is about over $600 million. Just to put in context within our own state how costly diabetes is, the emergency department data shows that we've had over 15,000 discharges in 2021 uh, for, over, for just under 12,000 individuals, and that the billed charges for emergency care over $100 million in 2021 alone for that patient population. So it's obviously very, very costly, but it's also uh, manageable and preventable in a number of ways. So what should be done? So the legislature mandated at some point in the past that every other year we have to, in odd years, I guess, we have to produce a state diabetes report. And the Cabinet for Health and Family Services has to do this in partnership with the personnel cabinet. And so we produced that this year. So this is relatively recent and it's brief. As I understand it, our reports were too long, so we were asked to shorten them so that they could be read more quickly. So this is a very brief executive summary. I think it's only 10 pages. But in here, there are five recommendations that the cabinets have recommended. So one, for the state of Kentucky, we should work hard to prevent new type 2 diabetes, uh, mellitus, um, uh, patients who get diabetes, type 2 diabetes, which is by far and away the most common type. So in, everyone in this room knows this, but for the avoidance of doubt, type 1 diabetes you generally get as a, not always, but as a child or a juvenile when your immune system attacks your own pancreas, and then you no longer produce diabetes. So you have to have exogenous or external diabetes as a medication. Type 2 diabetes is a metabolic problem. You're still producing diabetes, but your body's not handling I mean, you're still producing insulin, but your, your body is not handling and processing the insulin and the glucose efficiently and effectively, and so you start to have other metabolic problems related to that. So I'll talk about some of the specific things we can do, but here for preventing new type 2 diabetes cases, 
diabetes prevention programs and things of that nature can be very, very impactful, and we'll touch on that in a little more detail. The second thing is increased screening for prediabetes, diabetes, and also gestational diabetes, because pregnant women, particularly in the third trimester of pregnancy, can have diabetes unmasked or develop during their pregnancy. The third thing is to ensure access to diabetes self-management education and support. That's one of the things Barry is focused on and is talking about with the CDEs that he uh, still uses the term, the clinical diabetes educators, but to try to empower people through knowledge and information to be their own best caregivers, their own best advocates. The fourth thing is to fund sustainable diabetes prevention and control infrastructure and workforce in public health at the state and local level. So there's at least three of my local health department colleagues are here today. Uh, Pete from Agoffin and um, uh, Martha from uh, Floyd. I See, I do this, I rattle all these names off, and believe it or not, I do remember most of them, but it gets hard to shuffle so quickly. And then Scott over here from um, Kentucky River. And then the districts, because there's Barron River, there's Kentucky River, there's Green River, and it gets hard to shuffle all these things, so I make these silly gaffes sometimes. So forgive me my ignorance when I do some of those things. But anyway, there's at least three of my local colleagues here uh, today. And public health has been severely underinvested in over the long haul. At the moment, we're in a relatively good place in rebuilding and trying to make it stronger again so that public health can do population health at the state level to try to prevent some of these harms. Because there's all sorts of evidence that shows if we can prevent these things from happening, a few pennies invested on the front end can save many dollars down the road in healthcare costs. And what we do in actual healthcare delivery, while it's very, very important, it's intervening when there is typically already disease present. So we're trying to make better something that's already not good. Much, much better if we can go upstream and prevent things from becoming bad in the first place. You're not trying to restore as well as you can. You're trying to maintain it where it's already good. So public health is really important in this. So that's the fourth element. And the fifth one is to increase, improve capacity and access to diabetes uh, surveillance information technology tools, things, uh, software and data systems, things that can help us understand what's happening, understand where to focus our efforts, understand where our efforts are actually having impact so we can do more of that. And perhaps where we have what we thought are good ideas that are not particularly impactful, perhaps we have to stop doing those things so we can focus on things that are more impactful. So again, it's preventing new cases, improving screening, ensuring access to diabetes uh, education, funding sustainable public health, in support of uh, prevention and improving the capacity and the knowledge through IT systems and information. So what is being done? So there's a lot that's being done. So for the, from the public health standpoint, what we're doing here in Kentucky is we're working hard to increase access to and participation in accredited diabetes self-management education and support programs. So the Kentucky Department for Public Health in partnership with a large number of our local health departments and others actually has a free diabetes prevention program. We have a group that does diabetes prevention and control at the Kentucky Department for Public Health and works with partners. Um, Kentucky River District, Floyd County, Laurel County, Whitley and Knox and Powell, Gateway District, Lake Cumberland District, Lewis County. Those are Appalachian region uh, health departments that are involved, but we have 12 others in other parts of the state as well. And so we thank our local health department partners in that. You can go to, and I tried this this morning, you can Google, because we all know Google is the easiest way to find things, right? If you Google KDPCP, that's the Kentucky Diabetes Prevention and Control Program, KDPCP, the very first hit this morning at 8 o'clock was um, the Cabinet for Health and Family Services and the web page for the Kentucky Diabetes Prevention and Control Program. If you go there, it'll give you information about the program, and you can refer, you, know, you can where you can refer people to, how they can access these services and benefit from that. We've had some really good experiences and some good data, and I think later down here I have an example where I can give you some uh, specific numbers, but we've been able to show that people who have participated in these programs have been able to lower their hemoglobin A1C, referrals to other types of services and support have increased, and of, of course we hope that all is going to help prevent cases of diabetes, but for those with diabetes, help empower them through education and knowledge so that they can have better care and have a better quality of life. Now remember, all these things are interrelated. 
the cabinet's mission, the Cabinet for Health and Family Services mission, is to ensure that every Kentuckian has the opportunity to reach their, whole, their full human potential. We are committed to working as hard and as effectively as we can to uh, making healthier Kentuckians and healthier communities. And remember, it's not just their health. I mean, the health is important, but the health means that they can have richer, fuller lives through their human journey with their family, their friends, their community, their loved ones. Remember, this is economic development at its heart too, right? Healthier people are better workers, can work better, can be at work more often, right? That's better for the economy. It's better for our overall communities. So good health is foundational to good economies and effective um, you know, uh, development in our communities. So all of this stuff is intertwined. The second thing we're working on doing is increasing access to and participation in Centers for Disease Control recognized diabetes prevention programs. Um, so we have Live Healthy Kentucky, or Live Healthy KY is our diabetes prevention program that we uh, do through the public health system. But there are 23 national diabetes providers programs across the state, 23. No one needs to feel locked into any one uh, offering. You can pick the one that fits you if it's available in your region. And they do it in multiple different ways, in person, online, distance learning, and a blend of the, of the two. And so it, there's a lot of different options. One of the things, where is it on here? I want to, it's later down on my points here, but I want to encourage you to take a look at specific to Eastern Kentucky, preventdiabeteseky.org. So preventdiabeteseky.org if you haven't been there. Have, has anyone in the room seen that website? So I encourage you to go there. There are stories told by Eastern Kentuckians about their journey and experience with managing diabetes, intervening in diabetes. If you go there, and I'm just going to out, I felt really silly this morning as I was talking to Andrea from uh, uh, Representative Rogers' office and Scott Lockhart over here and Fran Feltner. If you go on that website, you all are used to the, Apple, the map of Kentucky that shows that all the counties in the eastern Kentucky County shaded. I was trying to touch on Perry County, and I thought it was just that little ditzel that's up in the northwest. I didn't realize it was connected to that bigger swoop. And this makes me feel like an old man, but I was on that little tiny iPhone trying to touch that little dot in the middle there and hitting clay and breath it and all these other ones. And they, they thought I was crazy, but it turns out that Perry is much bigger than I thought it was. Had I known that, I would have touched the bigger part. I would have had more success. But if you touch on those counties, it'll show you offerings that are available in that community, specifically that community. So uh, primary care is up there, is one of those offerings here in the county for where you can go and get diabetes education. And there's other offerings as well. So I'd encourage you to take a look at that. That's a partnership between the Department for Public Health um, at the state level, Apple Shop, and our partners in the Kentucky Diabetes Prevention Control Program. So I encourage you to take a look at that. It's a wonderful uh, online resource. And it's good to hear people in their own voice from the community telling their own stories. The third thing is to um, facilitate and support health system diabetes quality improvement efforts. So this is the th one another th the third thing that the Kentucky Department for Public Health is doing. And so we've had a good history in the last five years, despite COVID, of doing these quality improvement projects that focus primarily on connecting diabetes and pre-diabetes care teams with primary care practices. Uh, and through this work, we've been able to show the benefits of using bi-directional electronic referral is a mechanism to connect not just healthcare systems, but also community-based organizations. Mm -hmm. Now, this is not the point that my team gave me here to mention, but I'm going to use an example. So yesterday afternoon, we had the chance to spend a couple hours with Fran over at the Center for Excellence in Rural Healthcare, and we had time to spend uh, with Barry uh, here at Primary Care and seeing his Beacons of Hope, uh, where they have a recovery um, community uh, for folks suffering from uh, substance use disorder. But one of the things Barry does here in the clinic is they have a, a retinal scanner and they're able to take retinal pictures and send them over to University of Kentucky and have an ophthalmologist read those. And if there's evidence of diabetic retinopathy, they get a report back that finds that there's diabetic retinopathy. And then Barry's team is able to refer them to local ophthalmologists so that they can get screening and care. But they do all of that through the primary care model 
and help set someone up specific because remember you have to take the window of opportunity you have when you make it more complex people don't follow through right so it's one of the reasons with harm reduction we say you have to dispense the narcan to people you have to actually give it to them because when you prescribe it to folks who have just uh, emerged from an overdose they have only about a two percent chance of going to pick up the prescription even if they have health insurance all right same principles apply to just about any disease maybe worse with the uh, opioid and uh, substance use disorders, but same principles for adherence and compliance apply to these other things. Once you tell someone you should do this, but it takes them five steps to do it, the likelihood of them doing it is dramatically low. So what I saw here yesterday, what Barry and his team do here, is someone comes in, they have a primary care visit, they scan their retina, they get a report, they call them back promptly, offer to schedule for them their appointment for their follow-up and make it as easy as possible for that person to go and get the care that they need. That increases the likelihood of follow-through, increases the likelihood they start getting treatment and hopefully can avoid things like blindness, which once you get to severe vision impairment, not only is your quality of life horrible, but your ability to support your own activities of daily living, your ability to go to work, your ability to take care of grandkids, all of that stuff goes out the window or is markedly impaired, right? So that stuff is all very, very important. And again, it's being done here locally and being done right here in the community, which is really important. It's bringing the care where possible closer to home. It also is a great benefit because for those patients who don't have evidence of retinopathy, there's no need for them to go travel into the bigger city to go see um, subspecialists for certain kinds of things. Because if you can screen them here and say you don't need to go there, that works. And believe it or not, that's better for the big referral centers too. Because if they're focused on receiving people who have already been screened and they know need their services, it's all, it's all that practicing to the top of whatever your skill or ability is, you optimize the efficiency of the overall system. Because people are doing more of what only they can do and others are doing other things that they can help and be a partner in. And then the fourth part of this, actually there's one other thing here. Here's the example. We've got a lot of partners, so when I single any one of them out, of course, I don't mean to leave others out, but we work with a partner called the Little Flower Clinic in the Kentucky River District. No, they're another partner. So the, the Flower Clinic, Little Flower Clinic, they didn't tell me where that is, but over the course of one year doing this diabetes prevention program, from 2020 to 2021, they were able to take Grace Health's, oh, this is Grace Health's patients, their hemoglobin A1C down from 8.6% to 5.7%. So that's the difference between markedly abnormal to entirely normal, All right? That's a big difference in one year for a whole clinic's population. And they increased the referrals to Laurel County. So that must be up in the Northeast there if it's in Laurel County. So um, that, that's an incredible success. And if you can do that in one year, imagine if we could do that across the state and imagine how many people we could help. And then the final thing here, um, in everything we do, it's important that we work to provide equi equitable access to everybody. So remember, when people hear equity, different people hear that word in different ways. So there's racial equity. We only have about 8.5% of our population is African American. And there's a large concentration over in the, you know, Jefferson County and other uh, cities. We've got rural Appalachian equity challenges, right? Do you all feel everyone here has ample economic resources? Do you all feel everyone here has access to all the food and housing security and employment options that they need? I don't think so. So we have equity issues here to make sure that we can help every Appalachian living in rural Eastern Kentucky can have access to high quality health care, um, high quality health, and then they can reach their full potential, right? And there's other types too, depending on where you live throughout the state. There could be issues of gender equity. There could be issues of um, uh, other kinds of cultural equity, depending on where you live and what resources you have and what social support you do or don't have. So I've already shared with you the um, uh, preventdiabeteseky.org. The other thing I wanna point out is Kentucky is one of only two states that has licensure for diabetes educators. And you can get information about this. There's actually a board. So there's requirements. There's a specific title. And you have to get licensed. But 
the board is BDE, so the Board of Diabetes Educators, bde.ky.gov. But we're one of only two states. So if you have anyone who's interested in doing that, wants to know what the requirements are, if you want to have some of your own staff consider going on that journey, go to bde.ky.gov, and you can see what the requirements are. Um, and the other thing is, uh, um, before I give some other points here, uh, I want to thank Barry again for bringing you all together. There's another meeting happening today. There's a statewide diabetes meeting that happens every year. And, and we would have more of our team here today, except that they're off at that meeting right now. So there is so much work to be done. There clearly can be multiple initiatives underway at the same time. In fact, we need a lot of effort and initiatives. Um, but there's a much larger community who are here to support you, to partner with you, to share best practices, to share resources, and to work with this community here. Um, and they would have been here to support you. So please know that they are with you in spirit and would like to uh, be your partners in this journey and share resources and best practices. So as I step away from the facts and the figures, which I don't normally do because it puts everyone to sleep and then I feel like I take all the oxygen out of the room, I want to talk about a little bit of the things that I would normally talk about, which is when we take on big problems like this, it's real easy to feel demoralized and disempowered, right? Does anyone feel that's a little bit too big of a task to take on and like, why the heck make the effort sometimes because it's such a big problem, right? If, I suspect you do because I know that I do. I feel that, that tug, that challenge. I will tell you, I've come to appreciate as I've gone on in my journey, the value of the serenity prayer and other ways of that same concept, okay? So you all know the serenity prayer. And actually, we only talk about the short little start. There's a longer vo version of it. But the first part of it is, it is, you know, Lord, give me the courage to change the things I can, uh, the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And then there's actually more that's inspirational past that, but I don't remember that part. I, I reframe this into a Venn diagram because I work with a bunch of epidemiologists and I think they recognize the science approach a little bit more naturally. And so I put it into three circles and my team has heard me say this over and over and over for four years at public health. Martha, have you heard me say this at a meeting probably? We need to size up the world that we face and we need to put things in three buckets. I think we should put things in three buckets whether we need to or not. The things we control, the things we influence, and the things we neither control nor influence. Because you know what we do? We spend a lot of time on those things we can't control or influence, hitting our head against the wall, and guess what? The wall wins every time. But there's actually a lot of stuff that we can control and we can influence, and if we focus on those things, we actually can make a difference. And if you think about this, if every morning you wake up and you go to work and there's 10 things that frustrate you to no end every day you go to work, and if half of them are on the things you can't control or influence, right? And you spend your time railing against those five things, you're going to be miserable every day you go to work. But if instead you focus on the other five, and there's two things you can control and three things you can influence, and you say, let's fix the things we can control. Guess what? If you fix those two things, now every day you go to work, there are eight things that frustrate the heck out of you. But you know what? If there's two fewer things that frustrate the heck out of you, it's more likely you're going to have the emotional energy to deal with and cope with the eight things that remain. But if you fix those two you can't control, guess what? If people are like, my gosh, look at this. They made things better. That's, that feels better to go to work. Those are better. Now maybe those things you can influence start to get pulled over until you can control them a bit because other people then say, well, wait a minute. They helped solve those problems. Maybe we can work together and fix this one. And if through a period of time, you're able to fix five of those things that you could control or influence. Now when you go to work, there's only five things that really frustrate you. And do you think it's going to feel a little bit better to go to work when you re reduce that burden of negativity and frustration and interference with your ability to be your best you? I think it does. And I think we've shown that in some of the stuff we've done at the Department for Public Health to try to improve things for our workforce and improve the way we can provide services to our communities, the way we work with our partners at the local health departments between the state and the local health departments. So I encourage you to be thoughtful about that because otherwise it's too easy to get demoralized when we have 14% of our state and almost 18% of Appalachia has um, diabetes. It's too easy to get overwhelmed 
by how can we possibly fix this because it's such a big problem. And how do you fix it? One step at a time. One step at a time. And so the next thing is we can't make a difference. These quotes that people rattle off, I used to wonder when I was younger, how do all those older people know all these quotes and tell all these stories? And it's because they live life and you kind of see the things that play out that are true. But Margaret Mead's quote, Never doubt that a small group of committed people can change the world. In fact, it's the only thing that ever has. You can change the world, sometimes painfully slowly, one step at a time. But if you're persistent and you're sincere and you're passionate and you work with others, you can change the world. You can make it a better place. And, and so I encourage you not to get demoralized. And one of the things I learned during the pandemic, um, I started getting letters that were mailed to me. And that was before I then showed up at a press conference and said, I challenged Kentuckians to write me letters. And I wouldn't, I said, emails don't count. It's too easy. Texts and emails don't count. You have to actually write it on a piece of paper, put it in an envelope, put a stamp on it and send it to me and then I'll read it. And then I went through a couple weeks or a few weeks on TV where I was showing, I've got mail and I was showing these piles of mail that I was getting where people were writing their own stories, their own journeys through COVID and what it was like, what the impact was. Uh, mostly, you know, difficult, concerning, stressful, could have been bad because of the disease or they lost a loved one, could be bad because their business wasn't operating normally. They had economic concerns, right? Could be bad because schools weren't operating normally. Those were all journeys we all went through. But the thing that was really, really striking is how many people took it very sincerely and how many people were grateful to have an outlet to be able to express their, their journey and their experience. And then when some of them saw their letters kind of read out uh, publicly, they, they got to feel like they were being heard, right? And it empowered people to feel like they could have some active role in their life to try to have an influence or make a positive impact. So I didn't have the bandwidth earlier in the pandemic when it was so crushing to write back to people. But as I finally got a little more caught up, I would stay at the end of the day and hand write some notes back to as many of those as I could. And so I started ending some of those letters, those little handwritten notes with, never doubt the power of small acts of kindness. So this feels really simple and really trite in some ways, but let me tell you, I just, it is very, very powerful, at least from what I can have been able to see in my career. When you help one patient at a time, one after another, when you help one community at a time, you solve one seemingly little problem at a time. When you do it with trust and respect and courtesy and patience and tolerance and inclusion with other people, when we see each other as neighbors, as friends, as family members, we can make a difference and we can make these things better. When we look at things like, wow, diabetes prevention programs have shown that if you just lose 5% of your body mass, 5 to 6% of your weight, and you are physically active for like 145 minutes a week. 145 minutes, folks. It's less than three hours. These are not astronomical goals. So I'm heavier than I should be because of COVID. I'm gonna blame COVID for everything. I'm heavier than I should be. And I couldn't drink every day like some of y'all did watching those TV shows. I had to show up ready for work, all right? But I still gained weight. So if I were to go out and lose 12 or 13 pounds, my risk for getting type 2 diabetes goes down dramatically, in addition to being active just a few hours a week. And remember, physical activity is not going to Gold's Gym and bench pressing 220 pounds, all right? We're talking about going for a 30 or 40 minute walk in the afternoon a few times a week or every day. So if you could get someone to walk every day for 30 to 45 minutes and lose five to 10% or five to 6% of their body mass, a third of our Americans have a dramatically lower risk of becoming type two diabetics. Now, when I sit and have to testify at the legislature, they appropriately ask, okay, well, we're doing all these programs, but how are we gonna save money? Healthcare's bankrupting all of us. Well, let me tell you, we're not gonna save money because we make hospitals and clinics more efficient or cut their rates or try to pay nurses less or doctors less. We're gonna save money if people are healthier. 
And how do we make them healthier? We change our behaviors. And the next talk after me is food is medicine, I think. Right? Even Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple Computer Corporation, said, treat your food as medicine or you'll be treating your medicine as food. Right? Does that ring true? Do you have some chronically ill patients who take so many pills you wonder how they have anything left for their meals? So treat your food as medicine or you'll be treating your medicine as food. And that was Steve Jobs. So if we could design and build better communities where people could walk to a grocery store, where people walked to an activity, they wanted to go see someone and it was more normal and natural, it was the path of less resistance to walk, you could do that physical activity stuff if, if we could do that. It has nothing to do with healthcare. It has nothing to do with Medicaid. The legislature doesn't need to be involved in it. Neither does the executive branch. It's all about local communities. Can we design communities where people want to be active and outdoors and do things with each other? And you know what? It might have other benefits. Instead of us shouting and arguing with each other, I mean, we're at the height of political season right now. Instead of everybody saying how we're all different and we can't like each other and we can't treat each other with kindness and caring. If we were out being physically active and interacting with our neighbors, I bet we would recognize them more as our neighbors, even if we don't always agree. I mean, just think of all the compounding benefits of this stuff. And it sounds really simple and really silly. And maybe it is simple. I hope it's not silly. But it sure as heck ain't easy because if it were easy, we would have already done it. And I can't do that from the job I have. I have the opportunity to have a lot of influence in certain things. But I can't do this from where I stand. This is what we have to do in our own communities and choose what kind of environment do we want to live in and what experience do we want. But when one in three Americans are pre-diabetic, you don't have to make much of a positive impact in reducing a hundred million Americans to have an enormous impact on overall workforce productivity, healthcare costs, and quality of life. All right? So if you could take a hundred million Americans and have a 10% reduction, you're going to have three to four million Americans who aren't going to be diabetic. That's big. And you multiply those healthcare costs times all that, that's enormous. You think about all the problems we have, we can't afford things and have budgetary problems in the country, that would have a big positive impact. So just think, it's all related one way or the other, and you all have a big role to play in that, even if it feels in the given moment, one day at a time, it feels like small actions. Your individual small choices, small actions, all will have a profound impact when added together in aggregate. So I believe in you. You are doing these things. I know you can do these things, and together we can accomplish really great things. And what we'll have to do, though, is have confidence that if we do those things one step at a time, it will take time, but when we look back 10 years later or 15 years later, we can go, wow, it didn't feel in the moment like we were having that much of an impact, but look at the impact together we had. So I have faith in you. I'm grateful that all these other people are going to talk to you today in more concrete ways about the partnerships that this community has with other communities and with other uh, partners, the things that Appalachian communities can do itself, and the thing that Appalachian communities can do in partnership with other others across the state. And I hope you have a wonderful day here today as you go through this. And I thank Barry and the primary care centers for pulling this together and SOAR for organizing it and helping to, helping to help Barry because he needs a little help sometimes. Um, so thank you for doing that. And now I'm told I have a little time for Q&A. Look at that. I didn't even look at the watch. It's 10 o'clock on the button. That's pretty good. So they told me that we had this flexibility. So I have time for Q&A, and I'm happy to do that with you. You also will have a break until the, until the half hour, so till 1030. So if you have any comments or questions, I'm happy to entertain any of those things. And I'll repeat them if you just stand up and say them so I can hear them. I'll repeat them so that whoever's listening on the camera can get them. Um, but this is the opportunity for you to ask any question you want and for me to answer it or avoid it in a way that makes you like me better. So does anyone have any comments or questions you'd like to share? There's no pressure. I'm happy just to say thank you and sit down too, but I'm happy to respond to anything 
uh, to the best of my ability if you have comments or questions. Have I put you all to sleep? All right. Folks, thank you very much for everything you're doing, and thanks for being here today, and I wish you all the very best. I'm cheering for you because everything you're doing and we're trying to do together is going to have a positive impact on the communities we serve. So thank you very much. I appreciate it.